how's everyone doing? You alright? Yeah, oh, good energy. Good, good, good. Thank you very much for coming. It's the uh, Weekly Skeptic Live. It's the 83rd episode of Weekly Skeptic. And it's the fourth ever live show. Slightly fewer people than normal. Some of you might notice, which is because of the train strike. But thank you for coming anyway. We went ahead anyway, you know, because if you don't go ahead with strikes in this country, you'll basically never leave the house at this point. You know what I mean? <laughs> Although I do feel a lot of sympathy for those people who get paid more than me and um, have far better job security, but that's fine. I mean, you know, I work at GB News, so almost everyone has better job security than me, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> it's good to start, have a pop at my employer. I like everyone's come together. If you want to move up, that's great, but a lot of you have already, which is great. It creates a more cohesive, what's that? I said I can't get any closer. Can't get any closer, no, it would be weird, would be weird. Um, it would be a sort of a non-crime hate incident if you came any closer, I think, but uh, um, I think it's gonna be a good show. Oh, we are filming this, by the way, just FYI. I forgot, so I would have lost more weight, but you know, we're gonna have to go with it. It doesn't really matter. Most of our audience is uh, angry middle-aged men. Anyway, let's be honest. We've got quite a few women here tonight, though. I'm, I'm impressed, I'm impressed. Yay! There they are, amazing. You will be asked to leave shortly, but um, <laughs> just, just joking, that's later. Um, <laughs> that's once, once, the, once uh, the, the new religion takes over. Anyway, um, yeah, so thanks for coming. I'm feeling pretty good. I think it's going to be a good one. I was feeling a bit ill at the last one. This one, I'm feeling quite good. I've done quite a lot of coke in the toilets, so I'm doing well. <laughs> I saw the sign. It said zero tolerance drug policy. I was like, fuck the man. You know what I mean? So I, was like, I haven't really done that. Please don't cancel me or shut down the venue. Um, someone's coming with a, a bucket. Um, all right. I'm feeling good. I've got a slight shoulder and neck pain, which we'll, we'll get into in detail later. But we, yeah, because, you know, that's why people <laughs> come to these events. But um, what else? I'm feeling all right. I'm not going to do too much at the start because I'm not, I'm not a stand up comedian anymore, guys. It's not what I do anymore. I'm a serious commentator, as you all know, with serious opinions, you know, like women shouldn't vote and, you know, and <laughs> Michelle Obama's a man, that type of thing. Like a, I'm an important commentator. So I'll just go through roughly what we're going to do. We're going to go over all the week's stories, as we always do. Uh, and this week, actually, to Toby was in the news himself. Did you see that? He, um, yeah, he sent a, a dick pic to a stranger on Grindr. Um, <laughs> that was a different story, I'll be honest. He, he was in a story we'll hopefully get to later. It's quite a minor one. But there was the William Rag story. We'll have to get into that. Unfortunately, as journalists and serious commentators, we will have to talk about sexting and, and dick pics. And uh, that's, that's going to be one story. Then we're going to talk about the Tories, of course, of, who are banning conservative candidates from their list. Who, who could have imagined that? You know what I mean? So they just, they just want to stack it with Lib Dems. We'll get into that. Of course, we're going to talk about Angela Rayner. Poor old Angela. It's been a tough week for Angela Rayner. Just that reminds me, by the way, this uh, is my primary residence. Just, uh, <laughs> just for the avoidance of doubt, even though I don't live here, that in no way <laughs> negates this being my primary residence for tax purposes. Some people got that. If you didn't, it's the wrong, wrong show for you, really. It's, uh, it's about the news and stuff. Um, that's Angela Rayner. What else are we going to do? Peak Woke, of course. We'll do Peak Woke. Hey. And we'll do uh, Q&A as well if you want to ask us questions. We might do some bonus stories at the end. I'll leave it up to you guys. After that, some people can come to the exclusive bar. It's all very exclusive. Toby tells you his real opinions, and it's, it's great. It, that's if you've paid extra and stuff. But, you know, everyone's, everyone's a valued customer. Customer? <laughs> Audience member? I don't know. You're all customers to me. Um, but anyway, thanks so much for <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Um, that's all I'm going to do. So I think we should now just... <coughs> It's just time to welcome the man a fraction of you came to see. Um, <laughs> could be a large fraction, we don't know. It, it, of course, he is the third Earl of West Acton. It is, of course, free speech warrior, Mr. Toby Young. <laughs> All right, Toby, any opening remarks? I always forget to plan this bit. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I suppose we should say that we're recording this live at Lola's Bar in the Hippodrome in London's Leicester Square, which has very kindly let us do our podcast, record our podcast live here. We do it every couple of months on a Monday. Um, uh, but yeah, big shout out to uh, all the people here who've made this possible. Um, very kind of them. And um, it's a great venue. If you're ever passing the Hippodrome, Leicester Square, highly recommended. The food's really good. And they've given, they've, they've said to us that we can give everybody a voucher whereby you can get 20% off um, in uh, at the food and the drink in either of the restaurants. There's Chop Chop, the Chinese opposite, which is really good. And then there's uh, quite a nice steakhouse, the Heliot Steakhouse here too. Uh, if you haven't got, I tried to email everyone the voucher beforehand, but I didn't quite master the tech because I'm a bit of a boomer. And um, so not all of you would have got that. So if anyone wants to, 
go to eat here after the show and wants a voucher, just come and see me afterwards and I can email it to you. Uh, matter of moments. Okay, quite a lot of admin there, wasn't it? I mean, I've, I build it up with a load of jokes. <laughs> then it just comes in as a load of admin at the start. I mean, that will, that's for the recording. For the people here, that will sound mental. They're like, yeah, we're in the Hippodrome, mate. We know where we are. That, that, was, a bit, that was a bit weird. It's like, the Hippodrome's great. Yeah, yes, we're here. Um, but that was, of course, for the recording. You understood that. Um, all right, maybe we'll kick off, Toby, before it gets even weirder and do this first <laughs> story. It's fine. Um, normally, it's packed. I'm just going to roll with it. But it's, well, let's do the uh, first story, which is William Rag. Did everyone see this story? Yeah, he's calling now. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> he's better on phone than text, I'll tell you that. Um, um, see, this is why we come to the live show. Um, um, 11 years of honed stand-up skills, um, even though I'm sitting. I can do it all. Anyway, William Rag, he sent... We don't know if it was a dick pic. We just know it was a rude pic. I think we are, is that's all we know, yeah? An intimate pic. An intimate pic, very intimate. And he sent an intimate pic, as, as, as one does on Grindr, I'm told. Um, I don't go on any of the apps, but uh, if I did... It wouldn't be that one, but um, <laughs> he's on Grinder as you are, and he's sending a, a little intimate pics. He got in trouble. The guy tried to blackmail him, which was... Uh, and then the really strange thing was he sent some colleagues' phone numbers as well. As you do, you just immediately release all your colleagues' details. But what was even more crazy was that two of them then also sent intimate pics. <laughs> what are you doing? Who are these people? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, here you go. Uh, we've just <laughs> met. And he's like, yeah, I'm Charlie. Oh, yeah, cool, Charlie. Here's my penis. I mean, what, who, who does this? Like, how can MPs who have a security concern have a lower threshold than the average person? If I get that, I just delete, block, you know, I mean, not that I get much of that, but if I did, <laughs> it's so, so weird. Now, I, I do want to say before people shout, because some people have already told me off, blackmail is very serious, it's very horrible, et cetera, et cetera. So let's get that bit out of the way and get to the funny parts. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it would be horrible if you were blackmailed, but if we're kind of asking for it and sending extra pics, that was baffling to me, Toby. Yeah, um, we're going to get on to um, how Conservative Central Office's crack team of selectors managed to select MPs of this calibre. <laughs> um, but it is quite extraordinary that um, this uh, reasonably prominent backbench Conservative MP, he's chairman of a select committee, he was quite influential in bringing down first Boris and then Liz Truss. Um, he called for both of their resignations. Um, I think in Boris's case, he didn't think he was upholding the standards expected <laughs> of a member of the House of Commons. Um, and, um, and he's made this, uh, I mean, Tim, Tim Stanley had quite a good line in um, his column about it in the Telegraph yesterday. He said, he described it as a honey trap so transparent it could have been sent from a Nigerian prince. <laughs> um, and it did, it did feel like how on earth did he fall for this? Um, and as Nick says, not only did he fall for it, but when he, when, he was then, um, com when he was then compromised and threatened, he then coughed up the numbers of, you know, seemingly every, I don't think it was everyone, but certainly a large number of, of Conservative MPs, and, and a couple of them fell for it too. Um, uh, quite incredible, um, particularly as, you know, you read about people falling for these scams on an almost daily basis. I mean, don't they read the sun? Um, uh, and, it, and it happened to another Conservative MP about, oh, it was about 10 years ago, maybe, Brooks Newmark. He was a minister at the time, ended up sending a dick pic to a journalist in this case. And Did they still have dick pics back then? Wasn't it dick letters back then? No, it was, it was still the, in the infancy <laughs> Much more laborious. Era. You had to draw a picture. Uh, it was much more laborious. Yeah. Had to go to art school. Go on. I mean, it, it, what, was, what, what is kind of um, odd about this story is that, so William Ragg kind of, um, I mean, he didn't volunteer the confession. The story broke in Politico. Um, and I think just before the story appeared, he then confessed. So, uh, but somehow, because he made a full confession um, and said and apologized and said he did it because he's weak um, uh, and played the victim card, um, uh, he was forgiven by, by, you know, by the Tory high command, Jeremy Hunt. Um, Jeremy Hunt said, um, what did he say? Call him he said, courageous. Uh, yeah, he said, uh, he, 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 he said he'd given a courageous and fulsome apology. I mean, <laughs> it, it didn't feel particularly courageous um, uh, how he'd behaved, um, but... Um, it's not yeah. even the correct meaning, usage of fulsome, is it? But anyway, that's a whole other... Uh, that's true. Uh, yeah. yeah, and... and that um, was my problem with it. And, uh, Andrea Jenkins said, how is it brave? The brave thing to do would have been to ignore the blackmail. I really hope to God they can trace who's behind the messages. It's nauseating. Go Zach Goldsmith said he was perplexed by the wall of protection being offered by the Conservative Party. He said he'd been caught handing sensitive material on fellow MPs to what is potentially a hostile state 
to avoid embarrassment, having sent graphic photos of himself to a stranger. Um, and a senior Tory said, he's railed against his colleagues publicly and briefed against them anonymously time and time again. It's a disgrace that he's an elected representative. It's not for no reason. He's known as Torag. So, uh, not much sympathy from him. Uh, maybe he was one of the MPs whose number was passed on by yeah. Will yeah, They could Rag. have seen that coming. Hey, I'm toe rag. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, I mean it, a few things here. I don't think it'd be too controversial, but is there also an element where it's like a gay thing? Here's, just let me explain this. Because if you think about this, who else would send the picture, right? Because if, if a woman receives, uh, no, not just a picture, but if a woman receives like a fishing, it's called spear fishing apparently. If a woman receives like a spear fishing thing, they go, oh, this is a creep, this is dangerous, block, tell someone immediately, right? If a, if a heterosexual man receives a woman saying something, they go, that's a bot immediately, it's never happened. No woman has ever sent me random pictures, you know what I mean? It's never going to happen. We immediately go, this is something weird. Only a gay man thinks, oh, I'll probably just send the picture back, right? Because they're like... <laughs> Because a, ma a gay man would do that because that's apparently how it goes on Grindr, so it's, it's quite normal. Every, any other category would just be like, I'm, I'm out, right? Is that fair enough? Is that homophobic? Well, um, I it, it was, it was, I, I was intending it to be, but it, was it? Well, no, no. <laughs> I, think, I, think, yeah, I think in the case of Brooks Newmark, um, he was ensnared by a male journalist masquerading as an attractive young female Tory oh. activist who sent him, she, I, think she, I think he sent him pictures of the activists in a kind of uh, state of progressive undress. And he's saying, send me, and they sort of exchanged pictures, got him on the hook, and then reeled him in. Right. Um, so in fact, he did respond to a woman oh, sending so can pictures. Happen. Can happen. Yeah, with me, I'd just be like, that's fake, immediately. Yeah. The guy's got too high an opinion of himself, because I don't, <laughs> I don't even talk to women. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's, not the is it, it's not the most conservative behavior. Is that okay to say? Right, it's not the most, it's, I mean, I know everyone does it, I know a Tory sleaze is a thing, but it doesn't strike me, the layman, as particularly conservative. Or am I just behind the times? Am I out of touch, Toby? Uh, well, well, I, yeah, I think get, <laughs> Toby's terrified. Get, we don't have to release this. If you say something awful, we don't have to release I, I, it. I was at one stage on the conservative candidates list, and it was um, during the period, it was just before I got cancelled and ended up having to step down from five different positions, and I knew that um, heading towards me was a demand from CCHQ to step down as a Conservative candidate. They just hadn't got around to sending the email. And uh, so I voluntarily came off the list. Um, but I think that had I remained on the list and become a Conservative MP, I think I probably wouldn't have sent a dick pic to... Um, <laughs> uh, to Hang on. To, 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 to Putin's thugs. I mean, it was just... It was I've got some questions there. <laughs> when you say... You, but you would normally do it, but it's only because you're an MP. No, 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 no. No, I'm saying that had I become an MP, I like to think I would have uh, been able to withstand this temptation yeah, a little bit better. Yeah, I understood that, but... Oh, I see. I not not saying... just, just because that... Just because I always could. <laughs> okay, I wouldn't okay. just do it because I'm a Tory MP. I, I, <laughs> you would continue your record of yeah. not sending dick pics. Is what you're never saying. sent one, I'm okay. happy to say. Right, or okay. received one. Or received. Okay, all right. <laughs> Apparently it is very easy to fake them. It did happen to a friend of mine, so that can happen, but this was actually real. So, okay, do you think we've spent enough time on the dick pics? I, or did, uh, I can't tell if the audience wants more of it, but we've got to move on. Because um, <laughs> uh, we've got a whole show. Let's do this one then. There's another Tory cock-up, no pun intended. This was a <laughs> Tory, cam Tory, I'm on fire. Tory campaign poster. Tory campaign poster is pulled in storm of derision. Oh, that's nice, storm of derision. That's what we receive a lot of the time. That's the times. And I don't know if you saw this, it was like a rubbish picture of sort of Rishi Sunak in the middle looking all prime ministerial and then like the England rubbish football team and the king was randomly there. There was some fighter jets or something. There was a ship of some sort. And they posted this on uh, X and they said something along the lines of uh, Britain's, Britain's stronger than ever or something. Don't let the doomsters and naysayers trick you into talking down our country. They said the UK is as strong as ever which struck me as unlikely. I'm like, unless we, unless we own a 25% of the Earth's surface as we used to, you know what I mean? Like, really, is the UK stronger than ever? Or did we used to own most of the world? You know what I mean? I just don't, <laughs> I'm not buying it. So I don't, I don't really buy it. And no one else bought it. And they ended up deleting the picture, but not because of what I said, just because it was generally completely inaccurate and rubbish, Toby. Well, one of the odd things about this poster was that the caption was, Britain, the second most powerful country in the world. And you're thinking, well, Maybe China or the USA is the most powerful, but Britain is more powerful than the other one? That seemed like a bit of a stretch. I mean, I would have thought maybe third, 
at a stretch. Um, but second, like right. more powerful than either China or the United States. Yeah. That was a little bit implausible. Um, but the kind of um, the it's reason... Soft power. So maybe, but it didn't specify that. It just said Britain, the second most powerful that's country where it came from, in apparently. the world. It came from, the, we were ranked second highest for soft power. I don't know how they check our soft power. We do feel that's very soft. How many days. dick pics our MPs send to <laughs> that's hard Politburo power. Um, agents? <laughs> we don't know. Maybe it's soft. I wouldn't, I think who, it, would anyone send a soft power dick pic? <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> Here's it at, here, here it is at its worst. You know what I mean? Like, they're just giving you like, low expectations. Anyway, sorry, that's gross. That's not what we do here. We're a highbrow but, but, political but podcast. The, but, the, but the reason they had to withdraw the poster <laughs> um, is because, I mean, first of all, as Nick says, Richard, the England football team who haven't won a trophy since 1966 didn't exactly make yeah. the country look particularly powerful. Um, what about and the women, the, Toby? The, the, the glorious the, women. There were no women in the picture. That was another ah. reason um, they had to withdraw it. A lot of women said... So are women not part of um, this glorious soft power How superpower? How dare they? Um, uh, and in addition, they, they had a picture of um, a fighter jet, turned out to be a US fighter jet, <laughs> and uh, a shipping container, uh, a, a container ship, which was Swiss owned. Um, so it was just, uh, and, and, and I, I, I think that the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was they'd included a picture of Prince Charles and they hadn't sought permission. And of course the royal family is quite sensitive about being used in promotional literature for political parties wanting to remain above the political fray. So I think there was a complaint from the palace, even though the palace have denied that, and that's where they had to take it down. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, you're a bit desperate, isn't it, when you're thinking, oh, what can we do that shows Britain at its most inspiring? A, a Swiss container ship. What is that? <laughs> I don't even know what that is. I mean, this was from... Who, who was the Swiss... Who was the company? And there was one... Yeah, the jet was from Lockheed Martin, wasn't it? 50% of each aircraft's made in the UK. So we're like, hey, we did 15%. 15%, and, um, yeah. The Eurofighter Typhoon is made by a consortium from Spain. I don't know. It's pretty pathetic. Did anyone see this picture? Do we know what we're talking about? Yeah. Oh, they've withdrawn it's it. It's like a quickly. rubbish picture. This withdrawn. So yeah. it doesn't really matter anyway. So yeah, it's just a classic sort of... Uh, Another sort of Tory cock-up this week. They're struggling a bit, aren't they? Yeah. Go, was, yeah. Do you want to yeah. do the third Tory cock-up this week? Third Tory cock-up. Let's do yeah. that. Um, by the way, we've limited them to three, because otherwise it could be the whole show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We'd have to call it the weekly Tory cock-up. Um, so there was a third one, which was Rishi Sambas. Did anyone see Rishi in his Sambas? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. Rishi was wet. There's a bizarre picture of Rishi with sort of, a, sort of blue, sort of normal suit trousers, a white sort of formal shirt with these Adidas Sambas. And it just looks... See, someone's very, actually cringing. <laughs> <on me. laughs> Lois just actually physically cringed. It's, it's like... It was, was super cringe. Yeah. It was disgusting. <laughs> it was awful. It was terrible. It was just so rishy. There was just something so off about it. Like, who's advised him to do that? And the trousers were at a weird height. I mean, look, I mean I'm, you know, he wouldn't wear shoes like these. I mean, these are from Farragamo, Toby. These are, like, proper, like... Well, I noticed you're wearing... Uh, yeah. Is that A6? Yeah. So you're wearing trainers, so yeah. you're kind of doing so, a rishi. Um, I, well, I, one of one of the one of the in the, in the story about it in uh, in the Times, um, they they reprinted all these um, uh, tweets, all these tweets that people have posted about it, and one had said sambas and a dress shirt. Seriously, and I realise coming on here tonight that I'm wearing what he meant by a dress shirt. It wasn't actually what I call a dress shirt, which would be the kind of shirt you'd wear with black tie. But in this picture, he's not wearing like you know a black tie dress shirt he's just wearing a regular shirt like I'm wearing now but presumably that in this guy's eyes is a faux pas I mean do you think that you know wearing my trainers with a normal shirt in a suit is 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 a bit odd is it a bit have I have I, have I toxified the brand now not not that they were particularly fashionable in the first place but uh, no you just look like you've reached that age where like, you need comfort at all times that's true right <laughs> My trousers aren't actually stretchy, but I'm, get, I'm getting there. Yeah. He's like, I'm meeting the, uh, I'm meeting the king today, but I do want to be comfortable. So yeah, get the old A6 on. I know what it's like. I like the New Balance, but you know, you've got to at some point have higher standards. Lois, what was it that bothered you so much about it? It's just, it, he made it look so uncool. You actually can pull it off, Toby, but Rishi can't. She has to say Thank that. Thank you. She, she's, she's a sponsor, so she has to suck up to Toby. But no, actually, it's the other way around. We, you think Toby's pulling it off, but not Rishi? He is the most uncool person that's ever lived. We can confirm that if you didn't hear that. And uh, Lois is absolutely right. Poor old Rishi, just everything he does just doesn't seem to work. And it, we, we covered the other week that he's got hangry. Did you hear that story where he's fasting all the time and he's snapping at people? He's kicking them with his sambas. And apparently, <laughs> and, uh, he's furious. And he, 
And apparently Sambas were just, everyone was like, okay, that's it for Sambas now. People thought they were cool, and now it's just over. He's killed the Samba immediately. The stock price plummeted. I haven't checked, but I'm, I'm guessing it plummeted. And it was just a general faux pas. Some people said it didn't matter, Nick, what you want about. He can wear what he wants. But it's, in general, actually, I don't always have perfect tailoring, but in general, the tailoring is very poor. Isn't it? You see these pictures, and everything's wrong. I mean, Trump gets away with some shocking stuff, but he just kind of styles it out, doesn't he? But you ever see these people who, like, analyze the tailoring on, on X and they're just all awful anyway that's maybe a bit of a niche point I just sensed that Toby was searching for something so I was giving him a bit of time <laughs> you're right just is, is it about it. this story are you ready to move on no, let's move on let's move on there's only so much I can milk out of the Sambas but I was trying so my, t my fear <laughs> is running out of stories um, alright let's move on and do this very serious story there. It's, this is, it's hard for me this story because I'm just you know when the live shows I just like to get laughs all the time but we have to do serious stuff as well so let's do this quite serious story about the Tories and it's true blue Tories banned from standing in the general election. This was in the Telegraph, Gordon Rayner and Alison Pearson, a uh, friend of the show, I think she listened. So, and this was that the, the number 10 are accused of purging high quality right wing candidates with traditional conservative values to ensure party is dominated by centrists who send dick pics. Oh, hang on, I've added that bit. Um, <laughs> centrists, uh, and, and apparently, to to not Toby, Rishi in this case, similar trainers. Uh, Rishi. <laughs> What he's doing, he's kind of like throwing in a hand grenade before he leaves. He's going to lose. So he's like, I know what I'll do. I'll throw in a one nation hand grenade and then just get out. Like ruining the party. His legacy is going to be destroying the party and making sure it's going to be one nation forever. I've just looked right at the light so I can't see the story. But the point is, they were, they were finding ways to kind of de make sure that the candidate lists are rigged and they're full of kind of wets and that the, the sort of proper conservatives can't get anywhere. There was Aman Bogle, who, if that, is that how you say it, who sometimes does GB News, and he said he just couldn't get anywhere he was considering moving to reform there was uh, he said um he said in fact it used to be tell us your conservative values now it's tell us how you promoted diversity and how you've addressed white privilege and it's all rubbish like that it's all cameron-esque bollocks and um and there's other similar examples and alison pearson had a great piece about how thatcher herself wouldn't even get in and it's all rigged so, so that the so-called yellow tories which means the lib dem tories to get in and dominate toby any take on this yeah no i, I was um uh, obviously disappointed to read this um, uh, because when I went through the selection process, um, they uh, I, remember, I remember one of the questions that you had to like it was like an exam. I mean, you, you got an interview. Uh, it was quite a tough interview, um, and then you and, and you had to kind of make a little speech on a topic. They gave you the topic like you know thirty seconds beforehand. You had to get up on your hind legs and make a speech about it, and you also had to do a written exam. Um, and the written e <laughs> the written exam question was. Um, would you w would you countenance cutting um, the amount of money we spend on foreign aid? And I said yes, I would. I would cut it, um, and made the argument. And I, it sounds like today, if I'd have said that, that would have been a black mark. I wouldn't have got to to the first base. But they didn't exclude me in virtue of saying that. So the process has obviously changed a little bit wow. in the in the past um, well twelve years since I last applied or 10 years um but uh, no it was quite shocking um uh, and, and and i think it has been going on now for some time um and but i guess a lot of the mps that have been selected according to this process the so-called yellow tories um uh won't actually win seats um at the next general election i mean even though something like 75 seats have been vacated and i think we're on track now this is conservative mps announcing they're standing down before the election. I think we're on track to beat um, the number who said they'd stand down on the eve of the 97 election, which was a record until now. Uh, we're on track to beat that record. But And I imagine a lot of these yellow Tories will be parachuted into those seats. But one of the reasons they're standing down is because they haven't got a hope of winning. Um, so it's unlikely that people selected in the past five years or so are going to win seats, I wouldn't have thought. Right, OK. But there's also the... the parachuting people in, isn't there? Alison writes here, another cunning ruse is to leave a lot of current safe seats without a candidate, Basildon, Villaricky, Bogna Regis, etc., unfilled for months, an endangered minister, no matter how useless and or unpopular, will be parachuted in at the last minute. What's that? You can't stand Jeremy Hunt. Tough. I mean, that's another thing that goes on. Yeah. Um, uh, Alison Pearson said in her piece about this, I mean, she, she made the point that Margaret Thatcher would be unlikely to be selected as a Conservative MP if she went for it now, because she'd be considered too Thatcherite. Um, <laughs> but uh, she, she also pointed out that um, 
David Frost, Lord Frost, um, who um, has made no secret of the fact that he wants to become a Conservative MP um, and would be willing to um, give up his peerage if he was selected. Um, he, ca he, can't, he can't get a seat. Um, he's been excluded by CCHQ, presumably because he's, um, he's too right-wing, um, even though you know, he's, he's centre-right at most. Yeah, I know, that's shocking. That is shocking. So all the best candidates can't go in. But what is he up to here, Rishi, with this? I mean, to me, it just reminds me of elite theory, fans of elite theory from people like Mosca and Pareto and Schmidt, as I know our audience are big fans of. It, you, you just, it's all about never allowing any real choice. You know, democracy is an illusion. The candidates are all pre-selected. It's all a bit of theatre. The ruling class remains intact. The will of the people is a myth, that kind of thing. And this reminded me of that. It just made me think, yeah, the whole thing's rigged. The whole thing's a myth. I mean, but why? Why is he so keen to bring in these one nation types? Is he thinking that Starmer's going to win, so in the future I have to be the kind of another well, version of Starmer? The right can't gain enough well seats, I, enough I, people. I, the, so a source at CCHQ uh, told The Telegraph, these claims have no basis in fact. It's obviously a bit difficult for candidates who attack the party leader to be selected, given that they will be asking constituents to cast their votes for him to be prime minister. So that's their kind of, that's their explanation for why they're accept that they're only selecting fairly centrist candidates and no one to the left of Jer to the right of Jeremy Hunt. Because if there's a risk that they might attack Rishi Sunak, then how could they plausibly stand um, uh, for a party of which he's the leader? And then they went on to say, but the idea that people are not being put forward because of some ideological bent is totally false. This is the PM who is cutting taxes, bringing in major immigration curbs, curbing the excessive elements of net zero, and trying to get illegal immigrants sent to Rwanda. That's hardly some left-wing agenda. So that's uh, the Trying. We're well, trying, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. that. That's our policy, is trying to send 10 people back and failing. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're right on the first point. Very interesting. David Campbell Bannerman said that he just apparently, I wasn't being nice enough about Rishi Sunak. He said the whole thing is fixed. It's pretty blatant and undemocratic. As I said, the members have woken up to it and are pushing back against it because they're not getting the choice of candidates that they want. It's a funny old tactic, I mean, isn't it? I, Go on. I guess in their defense. Um, Here we go. May, may, maybe, I mean... This is, we'll get all the emails about whatever he's about to say. What, what, one, thing, one thing that's become really clear, um, uh, really since um, Theresa May became the leader in 2015, is that the Conservative Parliamentary Party is completely unmanageable. Um, it's like herding cats. Um, getting them to align behind a particular leader um, is incredibly hard, and that's why they've gone through, um, what, since Theresa May, they're now onto their third leader. Um, uh, and maybe, you know, CCHQ are thinking, we have to try and find people who are going to be loyal to the leader, who aren't going to rebel, um, who aren't going to make life difficult. If we're going to govern effectively as a party, we need, we need people who are going to be willing to toe the line. So maybe that's, that's the most important test for them, having looked at the chaos of the past kind of 10 years or so. Mm, so just a load of one nation managerial drones. <laughs> do, like, this is a problem. Here. Is that a problem with the right in general? People are sometimes saying, why can't reform and reclaim and the right of the Tories and all these people get together? People just, is it just because they're just individualist, beautiful losers well, as they were I once think, described? I think, the, I think w w w one reason is the one I just cited. I mean, I think the more... Um, right-wing candidates are probably the more kind of ornery and unmanageable they are, the more likely they are to rebel, more likely they are to be headbangers, basically. Um, uh, and, and then the other reason, I suppose, is that, that, that within the Conservative Party, there's still a dominant strain of opinion um, that you need to tack to the centre, uh, particularly during general election, well, particularly in government, if you're going to, if you're going to continue to win elections, if you, if you drift too far to the right. And this will be, this, obviously this will be a big debating point when the Conservatives lose the next general election. It'll be, was it because they've become too centrist, too bland, didn't do anything about immigration, increased taxes, or were they not left-wing enough? Um, is that why Ugh. they've lost? Um, look at <laughs> Labour's thunderous majority, they're a left-wing party. Maybe we need to be more like Labour. This was the kind of Cameron rationale for modernising the party in 2010. So there'll be a big debate about that. Um, but within the party, certainly the people on the right who argue we need to be true blue conservatives and pursue proper red-blooded conservative policies if we're going to win elections, they're certainly still a minority, I'd say. OK. And there was also, on a related point, 
this story actually from today that reform Richard Tice said he was using the media to vet his candidates that's an interesting one they, they don't have the resources to vet them themselves so they just let anyone in there isn't even a written exam they just show up yeah yeah have you sent a dick pic cool you're in it's like that kind of thing it's very very minor and then they don't have the resources so he said oh, we, we let the media vet it's, it's like what a strange thing the problem with that is it, it looks like he's dancing to the tune of hope not hate because every time they say oh one of these people said something you know said that they wanted to lower taxes in 1996 he goes right they're out you know what I mean and, and, and it just looks like we're being led by these extremist communists one of whom's a former national front <laughs> organiser I never get tired of saying we're being led by these hope not hate extremists and Tice is going good point I'll get rid of all these, all these people and, and he says that's part of his vetting process well it, that was a slightly odd response because if you were going to use the media to vet your candidates you'd want to vet them before they then become selected as candidates because if the media kind of tells you to throw them under a bus after they've been selected and you do that's kind of a little bit embarrassing and doesn't make the party look like a credible potential party of government although you argued the other week they had to do that and they were right to well yeah but I think I'm, I, 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 I'm not no, I'm, I'm not I'm not arguing that um, they're wrong to throw some of these candidates under the bus I'm arguing that they should have so they should have vetted them before they selected them rather than wait for the media to help them vet them once they've been selected yeah. and do you just accept that they can't do that because they just don't have the resources I don't know I mean I think maybe they um, I mean you know, it's, it's a new party um, uh, they probably don't um, have a kind of bureaucracy in place, um, at least only an embryonic one. Um, vetting is, you know, quite a laborious process. Um, there are probably all these enthusiastic local activists who joined and are kind of local organisers, and uh, they probably got a democratic process, maybe by which they select candidates. I don't know. But you can see how these kind of mistakes happen. But it, it, I think, I think, um, you know, some of the people that they ended up kind of um, deselecting over the weekend after the Mail on Sunday ran. Was it, was it this weekend, the Mail on well, Sunday? Mail on Sunday, they, de they defended some, then they got they rid of some of them, some then there was more yeah. from Hope Not Hate again. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not um, I mean, even though I'm a free speech, almost a free speech absolutist, I don't think parties deselecting candidates, punishing people for not towing the party line is um, a breach of free speech. I think parties have to have the kind of freedom to impose discipline to impose lines to make people stick to their policy program um, I don't think you can you know realistically defend a kind of uh, free speech being allowed to prevail within a political party so I wouldn't criticize reform for you know de for deselecting some of these candidates for straying too far from what they're actually promoting Mm, okay, anti-free speech case from the, the head of the free speech union. Um, <laughs> that's what they'll say on X. I'm just saying it now before they say it. But you know, I've defended, I've defended you a lot, Toby, on that, especially on the free speech union stuff. People want to just attack it. It, it does do great work. But um, I understand the difference between a party as well, like you said. But here's one for you. Will Farage come back? Because all my inside information on this suggests maybe not. And I watched the thing today, Camilla Tomney interviewing him for The Telegraph. And again, he was hinting that He'd rather do the job in America, you know, something. With, he says, Starmer won't ask him, but he'd rather do a, some sort of trade uh, job helping ties between Trump yeah. and Labour, though he admits it won't happen. But in general, he keeps saying, I'm happy with my income, I'm happy with my life, I want to dick around in America. He didn't say that one. But, uh, you know, he basically was making it sound like he really didn't want to come back. Why would he come back? It's an incredibly tough job. He won't get any seats. It's basically impossible, even though he thinks the reform are going to do well, and, th and then it's going to come down to whether you should vote Tory because you're going to spit mm. the reform vote, he was cocky enough to say, which is quite funny. But <laughs> it is also getting like that, isn't it? But he still sounds to me like he actually genuinely doesn't want to come back. I thought he was... I thought he would, but now I'm not sure anymore. Yeah, um, I, think he, I think he's enjoying his life. Um, obviously, less stressful uh, than it was when he was leader of the Brexit Party and before that leader of UKIP. Doesn't have to kind of deal with the kind of daily headaches of managing a political party, not constantly putting out fires, enjoying his, his, his show on GB News, um, able to earn much more money than he could as a party leader. Um, he's probably got a lot of financial commitments, um, maybe even some kids still on the payroll, um, an ex-wife, a girlfriend. Um, uh, uh, so um, uh, I think I think m m my impression is um, that he's he's not going to re-enter the political fray for the time being, and not before the general election. I can see him. I mean, afterwards, um, if there is a kind of um, reconfiguration on the right, if 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 there's an opportunity for a challenger party to emerge to perhaps replace the Tory party 
or if you know Keir Starmer doesn't do as well as everyone thinks he is and has to enter into some kind of deal with the Liberal Democrats and brings in PR as a consequence, then of course there'd be a huge opportunity for a challenger party on the right. Um, so I think you know after the election maybe, but I think before the election probably not. Hmm. I did meet his girlfriend the other night. Actually, she was very nice. But he, yeah, I don't know if he's going to come. Back. But what about this theory? And I don't really believe this anymore, but there was a theory that Tice is there to take the flack, all these sort of criticism about hope, not hate, and dropping candidates. He deals with all the tough stuff. Then Farage parachutes in and just for the win at the end. What do you think to that theory? I don't, I, I don't think... I think that's unlikely. I mean, I don't think... Partly because I don't think there will be a win at the end. I mean, because we have a two-party system, it is in, you know, it, it's I don't mean a win, literally, but, you know, well, the harder stuff's done. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, yeah, but I, I think that... Um, I think I, I mean, what, what? Even if he, if he came back, um, and led reform, yes, the damage it would do to the Conservatives would be even greater. Um, but I still can't see them winning any seats, um, mm. even if he led the party, just because the system is rigged against third parties. Even the Lib Dems, I don't think, are going to do terribly well. I think I don't think they're going to eclipse the Conservative Party. Maybe in, I mean, yeah. Uh, 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 so, you know, what would be the upside for him? How bad do you think Labour's going to be? That's my question. Because uh, Peter Hitchens has been warning everyone it's going to be so bad. Even he is saying, vote Tory. He's hinting it. Even though he wanted to destroy them in 2010, he's saying it's much too late. All we can do now is minimise the damage. He alluded to the famous Aesop's fable where, do you know this one with the frogs? And they ask for a, a king and they, they send down a log. And, everyone, and the frog's like, what's this? And they start jumping on it on the log and messing around. Then they start complaining about the log. Like, this is a useless log. He goes, okay, here you go. Have another one. And he sends down a stork and it eats them all. And they all have to hide. Sometimes it's a snake. Sometimes it's a heron. And then they will run away. And they go, hey, we, we like the other king better. So the point being, better to have an incompetent log-based king who doesn't do anything <laughs> than one that eats you all. <laughs> and Hitchin's point there is we've had the Tories who are just the log. They're completely useless, but they do relatively little damage in their uselessness, whereas the Starmer program will be aggressive, new Labour, actively destroying the country on many levels, all kinds of reforms, changes to the Constitution, GB News shut down, which I have a slight interest in, um, <laughs> things like that. You know, I'll be on the street, stuff like that. Um, so it's it, it, a much more worrying prospect. So even he is saying you have to vote Tory now rather than that. Whereas, and I think I put this to you last week, people like Dr. Nima Parvini, who's been on my other podcast, he put out this article, the Labour 600, saying let's have 600 Labour seats. The whole system will become illegitimate and absurd, and that will lead to sort of something new. It's kind of a big risk, but something new will emerge from that because it will be exposed the system as completely illegitimate. Because I don't know if you heard last week, I think I said it last week, but Tony Blair in his book uh, said that he was actually worried in 1997 <coughs> that he would do too well and obliterate the Tories and sort of destroy the whole two-party system. This was one of his concerns. So he's like, oh, I hope they do a bit better than I'm thinking. Anyway, any comment on any of that, Toby? Yes, so, um, yeah, I read that Peter Hitchens column. Um, and, um, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of Peter's and I love his kind of gloomy, romantic version of conservatism. But he's not a very helpful guy to have on your side if you're in a fight. He's basically at the back shouting, surrender, give up, there's no point, we're going to lose. Um, which, you know, waving a white flag. And, and, and his way of kind of um, uh, seemingly kind of um, squaring that circle is to say in this column, um, the country's finished. There's no saving Britain. Um, that opportunity has passed. I warned you, you know, in 97, and you ignored me. Um, you continue to have faith in the Conservative Party. More fool you, nothing you can do now, but we ought to try, if we can, to postpone the moment when Britain sinks into the North Sea. And for that reason, I urge you to vote for the Conservatives. It's not a great kind of uh, rallying call, is it? You know, vote Tory to postpone the inevitable demise of our country. Not to save the country, but just to make its decline slightly less quick. Yeah. The only thing, to let's be fair to Mr Hitchens, he would say he's not waving the white flag. He was saying it, it'd been, it's been waved years and years ago. He tried to destroy the Tory party in 2010 was the key time. And he wrote that book, The Cameron Delusion. I've read it. It's a very good book. He did that documentary, The Toff at the Top. Very good documentary. And he, he was making the case then. No one listened to him. Absolutely no one listened to me, he would say. And then he's merely now documenting what's happened, the demise of the country, Britain's obituaries, as he calls himself, 
and he, he would say the white flag's been waved and he would object, I think, to your characterization that he's waving it. Okay, maybe he would, yeah. Um, but, but telling people, you know, um, the only thing left to fight for is to um, decelerate our, our yeah. decline. He's right, and though, isn't postpone he? the inevitable, which cannot ultimately be put off. That, mm. that, 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 to me, is still quite a too gloomy a message. If you, if, you, if, you, if you want to galvanise people into... I mean, I don't think I don't Britain think is finished. And if you want to <laughs> galvanise people into defending it and standing up for it, um, uh, you need a better argument than that. I think it's finished, but, and all my friends do, but we think... But, uh, but, but the people in my... We've been written of, off before. Yeah, well, <laughs> the people I speak to, you know, I don't know, Lotus Eaters people and so on, they all just want to go for the complete... They want to, they're not going to vote Tory. They want to see the complete destruction of the Tory party. Let Labour get in. Kind of accelerationist approach of let's, let's let it get it really bad and then, and then something might emerge. But that is quite a scary but prospect because it, it might not emerge. And it's going to be years of despotism with me having no job. <laughs> That's the key part, that, I feel. That, I mean, that, that, within, the, within the Conservative Party and amongst Conservatives in um, you know, the first half of the 1970s when Britain was in an even more parlour state than it is now, um, there was this kind of um, stoical acceptance of Britain's decline. And the, 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 the conclusion was all the Conservative Party could really do, and their pitch should be, we can manage Britain's decline a little bit better than the other side. Things won't decline quite as quickly under us as they will under Harold Wilson. Um, uh, and uh, and that, that kind of defeatist attitude uh, was as prevalent then as it is today. Um, but actually, along came Margaret Thatcher and Sir Keith Joseph and some other people who didn't think that Britain's decline was inevitable and there was still a bit of fight left in the old country. And lo and behold, after, what, how many years, 10, 11 years of Thatcherism, she did manage to revive the country and um, restore a lot of confidence uh, 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 into, you know, uh, people and um, restore Britain on the world stage as a kind of p serious power um, and help to defeat, you know, the Soviet Union and its um, satellites in Eastern Europe. Yeah, although many would argue Thatcher was just actually, it was just liberalism. I think probably Hitchens would say that. Scruton said that, yeah, while many of her policies were kind of Austrian economics, of course she was patriotic and conservative by nature, but someone would say that's just a kind of, you know, economic sort of liberalism rather than conservatism. But yeah, definitely rejuvenated the country, obviously, but maybe it can be done again. I don't know. What do I know? But I think, I think maybe some sort of Dominic Cummings kind of pure sort of uh, party that just doesn't even, some non-ideological competence party could yeah. get something done. Well, but I don't see that. The startup party, as he calls it. Peter Thiel had... Um, quite a good analysis of why um, not just Britain but um, you know the West in general faced a kind of major crisis um, which is that Margaret Thatcher um, and her intellectual outriders um, they had a kind of trick up their sleeves to restore growth to the British economy and to overcome the doldrums oh, yeah. of the 70s which was to deregulate to privatize nationalized industries and so forth and that was a trick which more or less worked um, and was repeated, um, not least in um, former communist-controlled countries in Eastern Europe. It was also pretty much the trick that Ronald Reagan pulled off, and it restored growth across the West. Um, Blair's trick, he had a similar trick for restoring growth to Britain after the initial bounty had been reaped from deregulation, which was globalization. Um, globalization came with enormous costs and you know there are certainly lots of valid reasons why it was a bad thing to go for but it did it did sustain the growth that had been established under the conservatives um, but it, 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 those those are tricks that can only be pulled off once according to Peter Thiel so and he said he thought the conservatives intellectually were in a better place than labor because the conservatives have realized that they're going to have they're going to have to come up with another trick 
in order to restore growth to the British economy. Um, uh, Deregulation is not going to work anymore because we've tried it once and we've reaped that bounty. And there's, it seemed, seemed to imply that there wasn't enough left to deregulate, which I think is probably a mistake. But anyway, um, but he said, but Labour still think that they can just double down on globalisation. That'll ultimately be kind mm. of what Keir Starmer's policy is, particularly now that he's pretty close to Tony Blair. Uh, it'll just be kind of doubling down more, glo- more globalisation. Uh, and he doesn't think that's going to that's gonna produce any serious growth bounty. Yeah. He didn't have an alternative. He didn't say, no. here's what you should be trying. And of course, Labour, uh, Rishi Sunak, I think, probably thinks that AI can be the kind of third trick to be pulled out of the hat, uh, which will somehow bring growth to economies across the West. And he's clearly lining himself up to run some kind of AI investment fund when he leaves Downing Street, wants to be a tech bro, and that's why he's investing all this money and time in AI. Um, so but he's got uh, the Sambas. Teal, yeah, with the Sambas on. But Teal didn't seem to think, Teal didn't think that AI was going to deliver much in the way of growth. And the thing that scares me most is that Starmer, well, I've already said that being conservative or right wing is basically illegal in this country. Do we agree with that? It's basically illegal, right? It, but it might become literally illegal under Starmer. I mean, I know I keep talking about GB. It is my main source of income. He could, most people say he will shut that down. So that's quite worrying, or at least censor it even more. And I was reading this piece in The Daily Skeptic, actually, from Jay Sorrell. He, is that a he? I don't know. Is it, is it, it is, in, yeah. Is it a real name? Anyway, who, who no, cares? No, it's not his real name. <laughs> okay. Sorrell was saying that, um, that Starmer... More than anyone, it was Starmer more than anyone else who pioneered the idea that Brexit was not even wrong but simply unlawful. So he's claiming that he just works through law. His defeat of the Corbynites was similarly litigious. He, it, was, it didn't rely so much on a vow of criticism of their ideas, but a simple recourse to the party rule book to purge their ranks. Everything about Keir Starmer's life so far has taught him that his project, the defense of British society as it existed from 1997 to 2016, can be achieved by simply illegalizing all opposition. He openly avows this idea and has never strayed from it. And that's what I was thinking of. I was thinking we're going to have this unaccountable bureaucracy with Starmer. He just does whatever he wants. It's all unaccountable quangos. It's Ofcom to shut down GB, and it's all these other equivalents to that across the board. And by the way, part of that will be killing thousands of people. And before anyone quotes me and tries to get me in trouble, I mean with his assisted dying law, which he will bring in. He's obsessed with it. And we've seen in Canada, I know it's a bit of a hobby horse for me, but we had a 41-year-old woman who, who cited fibromyalgia and was euthanized. Turns out she was just poor and just didn't want to live. There was an autistic man who was being bullied. He got euthanized. In Canada, they killed 13,500 people in 2022, which was just over 4% of deaths that year. Imagine, never mind the ethical argument, imagine when Starmer gets control of assisted dying. You have no real recourse, no way of get, voting him out. He's got a massive majority, and he's just offing thousands of people. That's what I see do, happening. Do you think it'll be easier to get euthanized if you voted conservative? It'll be so easy. <laughs> it'll be so easy. I'm a presenter on GB News, feeling a little yeah, press yeah. this way, sir. Oh, there, yeah. exactly. Why <laughs> <laughs> don't just press a button? You fall through a trap door or something. It'll be very efficient. But it's very efficient, our system. That'll be Starmer. You know what I mean? We have the most efficient death system in Europe. Um, yeah. It's awful. It, it, this, this is going to happen, though. It sounds mad, but this is what's going to happen. Now, I do think that, um, I mean... You talk about criminalising dissent. Um, that certainly seems to have happened in Scotland um, uh, earlier this month uh, with the activation of the Scottish Hate Crime Act. Um, uh, the police haven't been... So far, they've apparently received 8,000 um, reports of yeah. um, hate crimes, which is roughly one every 60 seconds. And incredibly, who could have predicted this? Um, they have less time to investigate things like burglaries and auto theft. Um, uh, incidentally, that's one of the reasons the police um, uh, have stopped really investigating burglaries in this country. Um, I think there was, a, there was a stat recently quoted in The Telegraph that um, in the past three years, only 48% uh, no, 48% of burglaries haven't been investigated by the police. Um, uh, no, in 48% of, of, of neighbourhoods in England and Wales, no burglary has been solved in the last three years, and that's because they've been far too busy um, recording uh, non-crime hate incidents. Um, yeah. So we estimate that something like 250,000 NCHIs have been recorded in England and Wales since 2014, uh, which is roughly 65 a day. Um, so no wonder, you know, the police have li- so little time for investigating actual crime. They're too busy investigating and recording non-crimes. And the same thing is happening in Scotland. But Yeah, um, yeah, that's textbook anarcho-tyranny. Yeah. Coined in 1992 by Samuel Francis, controversial guy, but he was absolutely right on this. 
you tyrannise the average person, the innocent citizen. Meanwhile, you allow criminals to go free. You, you always hear these, you know, rapist goes free and so on. It's always like, oh, what about his background? You know, what's is he an immigrant? Is he poor? And then they walk free and they do some community service or something, pick up some litter because they rape someone. And then at the same time, the hate monster attacks you because you, I don't know, said you know a woman can't have a penis or something. This is and that's classic anarcho and That's what we're living in now. We can argue about why it happens, but that that was. It's got so much worse since the term was coined. I mean, we live in a constant state. And I thought the police not having time for actual crimes, but which they said because they're too busy doing, dealing with the nonsense report, mm. that's just textbook anarcho tyranny. Textbook. And um, the Law Commission of England and Wales, three years ago, um, produced a report recommending that um, in England and Wales we pass a very similar law to the one passed in Scotland. So they essentially have an oven ready. Um, uh, hate crime and public order England and Wales bill which is almost identical if not slightly worse than the Scottish version and um, the Free Speech Union and others managed to get it kicked into the long grass but it's there waiting to come roaring back under a Labour government and I've very little doubt that in spite of the embarrassment that uh, uh, has surrounded the rollout of this law in Scotland I mean Humza Yousaf turned himself into even more of a laughing stock. Who thought that was possible? Um, but uh, in spite of that, I'm pretty sure that uh, a Keir Starmer-led Labour government will dust off this, this oven-ready bill and push it through Parliament. OK. I just heard someone's sat-nav go off. Is someone looking at how to get out of here? Uh, <laughs> take left when Toby gets too boring. Um, no, no, it was very good. Sorry, Toby. It was very... It's, it's, we, part, we have to do the serious analysis part as well for our, our listeners, but we also have to do the comedy. But um, I think they've dealt with it. So let's get on to a story that might be a bit more fun after that quite serious story. It is quite serious as well, but it's also banter, and it's Angela Rayner. So, <laughs> way <laughs> only in this crowd will we, will we get a way uh, for the demise of Angela Rayner. Um, so here's one in the Mail on Sunday. This was their big story, actually. Glen Owen, proof that Angela Rayner has been lying, dossier of photos that reveals how Labour's deputy leader boasted of domestic bliss at the home where she claims not to have lived amid tax row. So I spent my Saturday afternoon looking at Angela Rayner's cushions, which is, I mean, it's how, what I always do on a Saturday, but this, this week it was particularly relevant because it was, it was the photos that proved she was, it was so absurd. I mean, we've all put stuff on social media, but basically, if, if you not follow the story, she claims her residence is one house where she's never been seen. Uh, and she claims another residence isn't her house where she was constantly there with her children, calling it home. So, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not a Sherlock Holmes job, but she, was, she posted things like, just got back and back home and things like this. And you can see the cushions were the same. There's a little chef mannequin that's the same. The pictures are the same. And then it was listed later. So you can compare it to the estate agent photos. It's an open and shut case. At the other property, she was known as the landlady and barely seen. She was like a ghost. She was like a kind of a Victorian... Miss Havisham kind of figure, never really seen. No, actually, Miss Havisham just lived there for ages. It was the opposite of that. She was never there. <laughs> and um, she was just occasionally would appear as an apparition. Uh, and she was known as a landlady. Like, no, she's not living here. The neighbours said, they, the neighbours at the other one said, she's definitely living here. There was a picture of a teenage uh, child's attic room. It's all very, very clear. And people have gone absolutely mental on the left because, of course, this means that the problem is she, she said something quite different when, making, uh, when it comes to capital gains tax. And she made a £48,500 profit when she sold the house. It means that she would have put the wrong thing on the electoral roll and so on and so forth. So quite bad for her. I've seen all kinds of lefties doubling down on X and just saying, well, there are various things. One of them, some of them say, so what? The Tories are worse. That's one of the things. Or they go, this doesn't prove anything. Or they go, it's just some cushions. Cushions move. It was kind of a pathetic response. Let's just be honest about it. If they want to say they don't care, that's another question. But the problem is then, you did care about Boris's cake thing. You did care about Rishi's wife's non-don status. You did care about the Deem Sahawi's tax status. And guess who else definitely cared? Angela effing Rayner. So, you know what I mean? So she cared so much. So there's the, there's the misdemeanor aspect of like, cutting corners before she was an MP. Okay, not that bad, maybe, whatever. Then there's a deception aspect. Then there's a hypocrisy aspect. But, so it's pretty bad, Toby, but what do you think? And what's Starmer going to do? And what do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, it, it, it doesn't look great for her, I don't think. I mean, it, it, I don't see how she can, you know, front this out in the way that she's trying to do. I mean, no matter how, you know, how big a lead Labour has, I mean, this is pretty embarrassing. Not only did she plainly... Um, uh, uh, mislead the tax authorities about which, which, which was her primary residence in order to avoid paying capital gains tax. I mean, that's on the face of it, it looks like open and shut tax evasion. People have said, well, why doesn't you just pay the 
1500 pounds you know cgt and have done with it apologize but i mean no if she's if she's deceived the tax authorities then she's committed a crime um and tax evasion is you know quite a serious offense tax avoidance rather um uh, no tax evasion tax evasion is quite a serious which, offense. which is one you do uh, tax avoidance. <laughs> uh nothing wrong with tax avoidance that's just rational behavior um <coughs> everyone does it um but Jimmy uh, it just means, yeah, if you go to a petrol station in which Gary you pay Lineker. less tax on the gas, you're engaging in tax avoidance, different from tax evasion. Um, but um, uh, and she, not only did she seemingly engage in tax evasion, um, but she also lied about it when she was asked about it initially. She issued this That's statement saying bit. that she'd had, she, you know, she, she hadn't engaged in tax avoidance, tax evasion, um, and she had, and she, and she'd been advised by. Um, a, an accountant and a solicitor, right? Uh, and then, and then, you know, people said, "Well, let's see, let's see the advice then." And she's refused to give it, even though she wanted to see, you know, um, uh, all the all the advice that um, Mrs. Sunak had been given. Um, and Keir Starmer's apparently happy that she hasn't turned over any of these documents. And you know, Mail on Sunday, this Sunday, have turned up this proof, which Nick referred to that, you know, the residence she claimed was her primary residence to avoid paying CGT was not, in fact, her primary residence. Um, so it's not looking good. Um, uh, and uh, I can't see uh, how she can maintain this line. And, um, you know, we'll get on to um, other members of the Labour front bench and what they've been doing to try and spin for her. Yeah, well, yeah, let's get on to that, because David Lammy did an incredible thing of coming out. Did you see it? You saw it. Unbelievable. He comes out and says, we, we've got to consider the context. It's like, yeah, that's what we're doing. The context is... Angela Rayner's hypocrisy, but he, he goes, he goes. Well, we we're not in government yet. It's like, ah, oh, you're not in government yet. So I get it. So when you get in government with a crushing majority, that's when you're going to start having integrity. Like you know, when you're an unaccountable elected government, but you don't have it now. It's like absolutely ridiculous claim. The context, we're not in government yet. I thought it was absolutely so brazen. And then the other thing he said, she's a poor northern woman. <laughs> what? It's like let's just get the identity card. Out. I was offended as a poor northern man. All right. I, as if we're just in a north... Of course, we cut corners in the north and lie about taxes like that. She's a poor northern woman in context. What are you talking about? It's so absurd. <laughs> was, yeah, the, the, the defences have been, A, she's a woman, and that's the only reason she's being attacked, because she's a woman. It's sexist to draw attention to her. Are they saying she can't do paperwork? I mean, what are they saying? <laughs> she, not good with numbers. She, yeah, yeah. Better with caring and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so sexist. confused filling in the tax return. I object. She's a woman. Um, uh, and then the other argument, she's a northern woman, um, as you know, of course they can't do their taxes properly. Um, and then, and then, um, and then, and then, and then, what is it? He, he, they had a, um, what's the word? Not a hybrid family, but a... a oh, a, blended. A blended family. This is the other one. If you're attacking her for seemingly dividing her time between two homes and not living with her husband and children, um, then you're attacking the concept of a blended family because you only think one kind of family is okay, you patriarchal nuclear family fascist. Yeah, that's not I a very convincing uh, argument either. By the way, I love, uh, I love hybrid family, like something that happened at Sellafield or something. It, <laughs> she is northern. Like, we're a hybrid family. We, 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 we never don't talk about Timmy. We don't, we don't bring him out. It's like something out of the <laughs> League of Gentlemen. Have you seen my hybrid family? Um, <laughs> But, uh, the, the, or it's like an Elon Musk family. It's ultra advanced hybrid family yeah. from Elon Musk <laughs> yeah. in association with Tesla. Go uh, on. <laughs> Sorry. And then, that and then, was, and then the, the other argument, the one that um, David Lammy has been most ridiculed for, which is he said um, uh, he said there were different arrangements and expectations for the Prime Minister than there are for Miss Rayner because Labour aren't yet in government. It's like, well, we, we hold Labour to a lower standard. We don't expect the same integrity from Labour. We don't expect them to pay their taxes or tell the truth um, because they're not yet in government. But they're going to behave differently when they're in government because there are higher standards. It's just ludicrous. I mean, that, that can't be the line. Yeah. I did just say that one, but never mind. Um, oh, did you? Yeah, Sorry. It's, it's all right. Oh, yeah. Toby's, it, was his, it was a Joe Biden moment. Um, so what about the other thing you want to say about Lammy Toby? Isn't he in trouble with LBC? Yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, you know... So um, Ofcom upheld um, several complaints um, against uh, GB News recently because various politician presenters like Jacob Rees-Mogg um, had blurred the line between being a commentator and being a newsreader. And that's why GB News has the kind of news bulletins on the hour to try and keep that boundary because Ofcom are quite insistent about that boundary being preserved. You can't have... Part, people who are politically partisan reading the news. Um, and um, so 
Jacob got in trouble for reading out in his bulletin. So various people have com complained when David Lammy on his show on LBC on March 29th um, read out um, a bulletin breaking news about the resignation of Jeffrey Donaldson. So he did exactly what Ofcom have um, uh, chastised GB News presenters for doing. So now numerous complaints have been submitted to Ofcom about David Lammy, and if Ofcom doesn't uphold those complaints, it'll look extremely hypocritical. Yeah, and it's good to see that actually LBC getting getting some of it back, because they always attack GB News, never care about LBC. Maybe that will finally happen. I don't know. It's going to be tough times to be a to be GB News or, or anyone who's not completely regime media. All right, those are our main stories. I think that's pretty decent time for a break. We, uh, not so much break for you, more break for me, sorry. Um, <laughs> because Toby's now got our advert to do, hopefully, from Thor. Yes, so um, this is an ad from... I'm, gonna do um, another, I'm just going to quickly go and do another okay. line. You do that. Okay. Uh, all right. And then uh, after I've read out this ad, I'm actually going to bring up Lois Perry from Car26, who are the sponsors of tonight's podcast, onto the stage. She's going to say a few words. But just before that... Um, a message from Thor Holt, our most loyal sponsor. Dear fellow free thinker, like you, Stephen is concerned about NATO Ukraine, his fully jabbed relatives, and what the US might do to the world's most effective journalist. Stephen said, Thor, did you know that the CIA requested options to have Julian Assange murdered in the Ecuadorian embassy? And he now faces dying in a US supermax prison for the crime of exposing their war crimes. Stephen went on, I've lost my mojo, I'm stressed out, grey with worry, and 20 pounds overweight. My consulting career is going nowhere. Please can we talk, Thor? Oh. Today, five weeks later, Stephen is feeling confident and positive. He's 12 pounds lighter, and he's attracting new consulting opportunities using fresh communication strategies. If you'd like to get your mojo back like Stephen, try my mojo boosting discovery call because unless your name glenn greenwald your completely reasonable concerns about big pharma or the military industrial complex probably won't pay your newly double mortgaged and other inflated bills sincerely thor and if you want to get in touch with thor you can reach him on info at thorholt.com or on linkedin at linkedin.com slash in slash Thor Holt. Uh, all those details will be at the bottom of the podcast on um, Podbean and on the Base Media website and on the Daily Skeptic. Um, but it gives me great pleasure to introduce our sponsor for tonight, the one and only Lois Perry from the fantastic Car 26. Is it working? Do is you it have working? To... Oh, it is now. It is now. I'm going to sit down. I'm not going to do a she of the ginger growler, Angela Rayner. I'm going to keep my legs firmly closed. But um, you might know me. I started Car26, the anti-net zero organisation, uh, nearly three years ago now. And um, at the first, you know, at first I was called a denier, but I'm really not. I'm really, 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 really not a denier. But, yeah, um, so basically we have been fighting for the last three years for you guys, we, um, you know, we haven't been funded by any oil companies. We've been accused of it. Um, we wish, uh, but we've been basically fighting against globalists who want to keep you in fuel poverty. So, you know, basically, so that you can't drive your car anymore. You're sitting in a little a box, no, not driving anywhere. You can't afford to heat your home. And we have made some real success. As I said at the beginning, you were called a denier. If um, you challenged the climate stuff, um, the science was settled. Well, that went down well with COVID, didn't it? The science being settled. So, but you know, we can't, we can't do what we're doing uh, without your help. As I say, we're not funded by big conglomerates. We're not funded by oil companies. We're funded by individual donations. And we want to keep doing what we're doing. We want to keep fighting for you guys. We want you to be able to have a reasonable standard of living and be able to pop to the shop in your car and not be sitting at home staring at a screen. So if you'd like to support us, um, please go on www.car26.org so we can keep fighting the uh, the good fight for you guys. And thank you so much for having me tonight, thank Toby. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Great organisation. All right. Awesome. Thanks to Lewis for sponsoring it and uh, for filling in for me there. I'm back. I've got my Diet Coke. I switched, actually. Yeah, yeah. I gave up Coke Zero for Lent, and now I can't go back. Complicated guy. 
Um, all right, so everyone ready for... So wait a minute, so for, oh, oh, oh. so for Lent you gave up Coke Zero but not Diet Coke, so you've now got hooked on Diet Coke. Yeah, because I allowed, it's not if much you, of a if deprivation. remember, I allowed myself a couple of Diet Cokes in a loophole. Okay. Because I heard that on Sundays as well, you're allowed to break Lent. But then okay, I but still didn't want to let myself have a Coke. It's very complicated, Toby. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to try and enter the mind of Nick Dixon, you'll regret it. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so we go into everyone's favourite section, which is Peak Woke. Hey! Hey! <laughs> all right, Peak Woke. So here it is. So let's kick off with this one you have, Toby about a non-binary patient. Sounds like classic Pete Woke territory. Yes, so uh, this is quite extraordinary. A non-binary patient in Canada is seeking taxpayer-funded surgery to create a vagina whilst also keeping his penis. Her, her penis uh, or his penis? <laughs> well, he's non-binary, so I'm not sure... His I think no. I think I think I think it's it's, I, pe it's penis. It, I think he predominantly. I think he thinks of himself as predominantly Their female, penis. but um, not wholly female. So he's not willing to give up the penis, but does think the taxpayer should pay for a, a, a false vagina. Yeah. Um, and um, otherwise, uh, it's tax evasion or avoidance. Yeah. I'm not uh, sure which. And um, and uh, he he's arguing that. Um, if the ta if, if if the if if the sort of equivalent of the NHS in Canada um, are only willing to give him a vagina if he has his penis removed, that would be discriminatory against non-binary people. Um, uh, so they really ought to provide him with the vagina plasty without insisting on a penis plasty, if that's the right word. Um, and um, one extraordinary detail of this, and he, this is a serious case and he's got proper support and it's gonna be heard um, by the courts in Canada and no doubt he'll win. And there is actually a precedent. Another patient had exactly the same procedure and it was entirely funded by the taxpayer. Cost between eight and 56,000 pounds apparently. And um, he said, uh, one of the extraordinary things was that um, uh, uh, one, a, a doctor, um, uh, no, someone from the parents group, what Canadian gender report said, yeah, the goal with, no, no, this is what a plastic surgeon said, the goal with phallus, pres a phallus preserving vaginoplasty, that's the name I'm of the sorry. procedure. <laughs> a a phallus, phallus preserving the, vaginoplasty. The goal of a phallus preserving vaginoplasty is to create a vagina that is aesthetically pleasing whilst maintaining the original genital structure of the penis. So, uh, the idea is that, I mean, wh why, well, I mean, the idea that it would be aesthetically pleasing to see both genitalia simultaneously um, uh, on a naked man um, is just bizarre. I mean, uh, that's a tough call for a plastic surgeon to create something aesthetically pleasing, but it's both. I mean, what, what's going on I think going say it's a tough call for a bloke, whether he would go along with it. But yeah, uh, yeah would that put off anyone here? Don't, don't answer that. You don't have to answer that. Um, <laughs> Logistically difficult, isn't it? But does that mean the person can effectively have sex with themselves? Like yeah, I, a, like yeah. a snake um, or a yeah, seahorse. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't know why. I'm not sure. The uh, maybe, maybe the plastic surgeon basically? could design it in such a way. But even though it would be quite, I can't. It'd really be logistically it difficult. Work. It'd be like that, that rumor yeah. about Prince. Yeah. We don't want to go into that rumour about Prince, but um, there's a rumour that he removed his ribs. We don't need to go into that. It's a, it's a highbrow political show. This is listened to by several like top Tory politicians. I mean, they're talking about the logis logistics of a penis vagina. It's like, sometimes I'm embarrassed that Lord, Lord Frost listens to this. I'm, I want to apologise on behalf of everyone. Um, all right, let's do this one. Uh, just This is off the back of yours, but it's a bit more dry, unfortunately. It's uh, No pun intended. <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. I'm just naturally like, I'm funny. I can't help it. I'm so sorry. Um, this was in the Telegraph and it's denying pupils can change sex, maybe breaking the law, teachers warn. This was Bath and Wells Multi Academy Trust. It's a group of Church of England schools. Shocker for the Church of England to do something woke. But an analysis of more than 600 policies showed teachers are being told to transition children as young as four without their parents' knowledge and to allow them to sleep in dormitories and use toilets that match their gender identity. And they said everyone has the right to their own beliefs, whether based in faith or another philosophical system. But it is the position of our trust that the expression of the belief that sex and gender are unchangeable when heard or seen by pupils, colleagues, parents, carers and other visitors to our schools is damaging to those affected by gender dysphoria. But this is incredible. I mean, this, this, is, uh, this is surely, it's even a breach of the Equalities Act. If we if we care about such things, but Maya Forstadt have won this case, so it shouldn't this shouldn't be happening, but yeah. it still is. They're just going rogue. Well, it, it's um yeah, the, the, their advice seems to predate Maya Forstadt's victory right. in the Employment Appeals Tribunal. Um, so um, 
Yeah, they, they've argued, this Christian multi-academy trust, that to um, allow people to um, uh, express their belief in the biological reality of sex uh, in an environment in which they might be overheard by someone or someone caring for someone suffering from gender dysphoria or someone related to would be a breach of the Equality Act. And you often see the Equality Act gold-plated in this way to essentially enforce woke dogma. The claim is that if you, if you dissent from woke dogma, uh, uh, it, it, it's a breach of the Equality Act. Um, and the Free Speech Union, because that's wrong, and because um, various um, beliefs are protected by the Equality Act, including, after my awful status victory, the belief in the biological reality of sex, whereby to punish people for expressing them is unlawful discrimination, um, we're often winning cases in the Free Speech Union by pointing out to these organisations, often educational organisations, that gold plate the Equality Act in this way, often having listened to advice given to them by Stonewall, who seem to be deliberately misrepresenting the Equality Act in order to pursue their particular uh, agenda. Uh, but we often win cases because people have just got equalities law wrong. Hmm. Yeah, all right, Toby's always got the stats, that's good. I just, I was started thinking about that penis vagina again, so I sort of zoned out, but, um, um, <laughs> all right, it's shocking that, and you say they're Christians, but they're not Christians, they're monsters. Um, as a, quoting a paraphrasing of a League of Gentlemen again, let's do this one then. Romeo and Juliet theatre style suffers barrage of online racial abuse, that was how The Guardian put it, so pinch of salt, but I'm sure it was nasty to get abuse, because there's Tom Holland, who's actually the son of a comedian I, I used to know and gig with, He's, he obviously is Spider-Man as well, that's the main thing. And he's now going to be in Romeo and Juliet with Francesca Amawuda Rivers. Sorry about the pronunciation. But she's black and some people have said, you know, I don't know, is it woke casting? Then again, you know, Shakespeare's been, had loads of reinterpretations. The Baz Luhrmann one had all kinds of people in it. John Leguizamo as Tybalt. He probably, Tybalt probably wasn't Hispanic. It was in Verona in Italy. So there's all these, re so maybe it's not a big deal. Some people were quite mean about her looks, felt that she wasn't maybe quite Juliet in looks. I don't want to comment on that. It'd be, it'd be rude, but um, I don't know. Was this woke casting or was it just that people are looking for woke casting now and everything we just think is going to be woke? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I always used to have this argument with James Dellingpole on the late lamented London Calling. Um, and uh, and um, I would always, I mean, my, my, my position is that um, there's nothing wrong with colorblind casting. Um, that um, it may, um, uh, may mean it takes you slightly longer to suspend disbelief, um, but in the end, if they're, if they're good actors, um, it doesn't matter. You get swept up in the story, and so Absolutely. much of what you're expected to believe is kind of on the face of it, kind of implausible and empirically falsifiable. But if you're swept along in the story, if the drama kind of lifts you and engages you, you quickly stop noticing. Can I just say that's nonsense? Because one thing, <laughs> co colorblind casting is not what it is. That suggests like, oh, we're just the best person for the job. No, no, it's, well, it's anti-white casting. That's uh, what it is. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's always like, I was going to go. I was going to go on to say um, that I was um, uh, the, the, the problem for me is not colorblind casting. It's that the beneficiaries of colorblind casting are always black and brown people it's not and never white is it? people. It's not very colorblind, um, is it? Well, it, it's it, diversity, it, 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 it's deliberate casting. You could think casting. of another name for it, but but I think if 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 white, white people casting. were cast as often in in non-white roles, um, uh, then then there'd be then there'd be nothing to object to. Um, uh, but uh, see how uh, absurd it would be if it really was colorblind. That would be I'd be in a way okay with it, but it's also absurd if you had a thing about a film about transatlantic slavery or something, and the slaves in like the American South are all Norwegians. You'd be like, this is weird. <laughs> this is weird. So of course, with historical things, and Shakespeare is historical to a degree, and some of them are histories. Okay, it's a bit of ro room for maneuver with Romeo and Juliet. I mean, they're probably not using fourteen-year-old actors for a start. You know, they say Romeo and Juliet are probably about fourteen. That would be weird. So maybe. Maybe there is some leeway, but when it comes to historical things, Anne Boleyn, things like that, it's pretty absurd. Wouldn't happen the other way around. Well, it, um, I guess it did happen in the case of um, Olivier blacking up to play Othello. Um, and uh, most actors who played Othello were white back in the day. And you could, I suppose, argue that that was a form of kind of early pioneering colorblind casting. Yeah, but, that's but, weird but, as well. But, but the, I'm but against the that as well. The, re the, reason, the reason the proponents of colorblind casting are hypocritical is because actually um, a professor at an American university, professor of English, I think, who showed his class Othello's film of, um, uh, 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 sorry, Laurence Olivier's 
the film of Laurence Olivier playing Othello, he got into trouble and I think was, was, was sacked um, because it was considered such a grotesque insult to show a white actor in blackface playing Othello. Whereas, you know, it, it should be acceptable both ways. Okay, well, didn't you have another one on this topic? Wolf yeah, Hall. There's, yeah, Wolf Hall has is, um, is attracted a bit of controversy. Um, new series, later series of Wolf Hall. Um, but this time, um, many of the characters in Tudor Britain are going to be played by non-white actors, um, but in a kind of slightly kind of um, uh, inconsistent way. So Lady Margaret Seymour, the mother of Jane Seymour, is going to be played by Sarah Priddy, who's a British actress of Bahamian descent, but Jane Seymour, I think, is going to be played by a white actress. And um, uh, this is um, uh, one of the, one of the um, excuses is that the latest adaptation of Mantel's sequence um, is going gonna, is gonna to show more interest, greater historical focus on the black population of Tudor England. Um, so that <laughs> just slightly, yeah, that was uh, that was slightly perplexing. Someone said both of them, uh, just in yeah. case the podcast didn't pick that up. Yeah, um, uh, but uh, yes. So um, uh, I, I, I I await that with interest. Let's do one more then about Roald Dahl. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, there's a, a couple of um, actors, um, actually a DJ and um, a newsreader. Um, have got into trouble because they've, they've, they've created a spin-off of The Twits by Roald Dahl. Um, and the idea is it's going to be read by Connie Huck. Um, all three have got into trouble because um, they got a cartoonist to draw a picture of the kind of reimagined couple at the centre of this novel. Um, and Mrs. Twit has a glass eye. And, um, and in the kind of promotional video for this new programme, um, uh, the, the Chris Smith, the DJ, Greg James, the DJ, and Chris Smith, the BBC News read, reader, described um, these characters as disgusting. And so the, um, uh, what the Royal National Institute of Blind People <laughs> has complained that um, to describe someone with a glass eye as disgusting is ableist um, and um, unfair on blind people. Um, some of whom choose to wear glass eyes. Yeah. I, nice. <laughs> Gentleman here says, I don't see it. You missed that joke, but it was, it was killer. Um, they, say, they say there's nothing at all revolting about prosthetic eyes. We think they're brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant's maybe going a bit far. Maybe they are useful, I suppose. Yeah. All right, we, we don't want to do too much longer, partly because people are talking. I can hear the ladies at the back talking, who, whose photo I took before, so I think they should at least remain silent for five more minutes but um, I'm, I'm, I'm in danger of going on too long because there is a, a lady over there who's at, literally reading a menu rather than listening that's how boring it is so um, so I'm just going to gauge how long to do what were you going to say so should we wrap up well, the I'm gonna, I'm gonna section now I'm going to ask do people want us to do any more stories or should we do the Q&A who wants, who wants a couple more stories alright who, who wants the Q&A Oh, one bomb bloke. Um, <laughs> and the rest of them was zoned out, didn't even listen to the question. All right, I, don't want, I just don't want to do too long because it, you know, it's tricky, because it? the listeners always demand loads, but then the live audience is, is only so long you can sit there. I th- all right, well, that pretty much wraps up Peacock. I, I thought about doing this traditional knob-throwing contest is back, but I, I didn't want to get too low brow. But um, this was, uh, I don't know if you follow this, but, well, all it was was at Dorchester. Dorchester? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, Dorchester has its knob-throwing uh, festival, you'll probably know it's the knob throwing games. And um, but the problem was, I don't know if this is peak woke or sort of health and safety and gone mad. But it's the uh, the eating race has been scrapped over fears of people choking on a knob. Uh, <laughs> so you know about the knob. Th- these are like it's, it's a standard. It's like a it's what it's like a biscuit. It's like a bu- a bap or a biscuit. And it, it's a kind of classic. It's a it's a it's a traditional biscuit. It's a hard and savoury bake. A no bap. So they're worried about people no choking on baps. No, it's knob. <laughs> they, and anyway. They all, it's a classic, it's in chill from, you must know Toby, every year they have a yeah. knob and spoon race, guess the weight of the big knob, knob painting. I'm reading these obviously, knob pyramid and knob darts, that was what the one that Philip Rag was engaged in, but. Um, <laughs> Will Rag. And, uh, with, with, with Philip, I say Philip Rag, who's that? Okay, with, that's, an, that's another breaking story. William Rag, we, we'll edit that joke so it works in post. Um, all right, <laughs> and that was ruled out because of the simple fear of people choking on a knob. What, what's it come to? Toby, when people can't choke on a... Anyway, Shocking. anyway, the point is, that's Pete Woke. Um, okay, so now we'll do then a little bit of content for... Go on. Well, we we ought to say that this is the end of the 
free section yeah. of the podcast. And um, if, if, if anyone listening or watching wants to see the additional bit in yeah. which we've got a couple more stories and we'll be answering questions from our live audience, um, they should go to basedmedia.org yes. and become premium subscribers, which they can do for as little as £5 a month. Oh, you're so, telling the people here, but they're literally here, so they're like they're already going to see it. Yeah, but anyone but, but else—that's that, for the benefit of the people who aren't here. Um, yes. So yeah. One we, of the one of the benefits people here get is that without even being premium subscribers, so I imagine all of you are, you get to see the free, the the premium section in a second. Yes. So go to basemedia.org, and for all our free people at home, we should say, stay skeptical. <laughs> stay skeptical. <laughs>